how do the lungs expand and contract? So you can title this page Mechanical Ventilation or the Mechanics of Ventilation. How the lungs inflate and deflate. So I've made some exaggerated pictures. This is a picture of the lungs at the end of a big inhalation. And this is a picture of the lungs at the end of a big exhalation. Not surprisingly, lungs are big here, lungs are small here. The end of a big inhale, the, you have big lungs. At the end of an exhale, small lungs. But there are the same number of alveoli in the lungs here as there are here, right? There's about a million in this lung here, and there's about a million in this lung here. So what must be happening is that the individual alveoli are either getting bigger or smaller. So if this represents one alveolus, then look how big it's expanding during the inhale, and all the millions are doing that along with it. You know, a million alveoli doing this. And then at the end of a big exhale, the alveoli have shrunk down. Oops, shrunk down. Put the arrows the wrong way, didn't I? Okay, so what makes this happen? What makes the lungs get big? What makes the lungs get small? Well, first of all, there's important muscular involvement. And the most important muscular involvement to note is the diaphragm. The diaphragm moves up when you exhale, and you can see that that's going to make the lungs smaller. And the diaphragm moves down in an inhale, and it makes the lungs bigger. So for muscular involvement, the diaphragm contracts to cause inhalation. And then all that's necessary for exhalation is for the diaphragm to relax. So restful breathing is passive. Restful breathing is passive. Okay, now what about if you want to have a big inhalation other muscles for example the sternocleidomastoid which you guys know from 241 as the SCM and also Rib meat, you've ever eaten ribs, right? Well, those are muscles. Rib meat called the external intercostals. When these contract, they bring out the rib cage. So this expands the rib cage so that the lungs gets bigger, and the SCM lifts the rib cage so that the lungs get bigger. The diaphragm going down also makes the lungs get bigger. Now let's compare that with a big exhalation. If you try it right now, you might be able to figure out what's necessary. If you take a big inhalation, you can feel your SCM contracting, you can feel your external intercostals expanding your rib cage out, and although you can't see it, your diaphragm is going down and then blow out as much as you can. Ooh. 
What are you doing? You're contracting your abdominal muscles. So a big exhalation and rib muscles known as the inter or internal intercostals. When these contract, they're attached to the ribs in such a way that they make the rib cage deflate back in. Okay, now when um, the volume gets bigger in or sorry, when the lungs expand, the volume goes up. And when the lungs get smaller, the volume goes down. So, if you know, so it looks like I'm, my lines are a little bit off here. So you know that when um, volume gets smaller, pressure goes up. So if volume gets bigger, then pressure goes down. So these are inversely related. If there's more room for the air, then the pressure for that air is going to go down. Conversely, when you exhale, your lungs, uh, the volume gets smaller and that increases the pressure inside of your lungs. And then what happens is that if you don't have very much pressure inside your lungs, then air flows in. And you can understand this if you just figure, okay, pressure in the lungs is less than outside of the body. So air pressure So air pressure is greater than lung pressure, so air flows in. And then in order for us to exhale, at that point, we make the lungs so tiny that the pressure in here is greater than it is outside of the body, and so air wants to flow out. Then atmospheric pressure. Well, I should change that over. Instead of saying air pressure, I should say atmospheric pressure. So small lungs have higher pressure than atmospheric pressure, so air flows out. Now the cool thing about this is that it doesn't have to be a big difference between atmospheric pressure and the pressure inside of your lungs. A difference of one millimeter of mercury would be enough, right? Air is going to flow down its pressure gradient. So let's look at what atmospheric pressure is. At sea level, it's about 760 millimeters of mercury when you're breathing in. And when you're breathing out, it's still 760, 760 millimeters of mercury. Because you breathing in and out is not changing atmospheric pressure, right? But now, we'll look at where pressure is a little bit different. Intrapulmonary pressure is the pressure in the alveolus. And when you breathe in and you make the volume in all of those alveoli get bigger, then the pressure goes down in those alveoli. And it actually gets to, mm, at rest, if you're just sitting there restfully, might go to 759 millimeters of mercury. So what happens is, is if atmospheric pressure is greater than the pressure in the alveoli, then air will flow in. Air is just going to flow from its area of high concentration outside of the body to its area of lower concentration inside of the body. 
Now, can you figure out what needs to happen here? At rest, if your diaphragm relaxes and moves up, all it has to do is make the pressure in the alveoli go up just enough that it is a little bit more than atmospheric pressure. So it just has to go up just a little bit. Now, if you're doing really big inhales and really big exhales, maybe this number would go down to minus four. Maybe this number would go up to plus four. Depending on the health of your lungs and the elasticity, you can have a pretty big inhale and a pretty big exhale to get to a negative pressure. Remember though, if you lose that elasticity, it doesn't work very well. But now I'm gonna give you another pressure. This is the pressure in the pleural cavity. This is the pressure that's between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. Remember there's a little bit of fluid in there? And when um, you're at rest, there's always less pressure in that fluid than there is at atmosphere. And that helps to keep the lungs always inflated. So at rest, or sorry, at the biggest um, inhale, oh, no, let me speak again, I'm sorry. When you are going to do a normal breath and breathe in, then the pressure inside the pleural cavity goes all the way down to 753 millimeters of mercury. So there is less pressure there than there is in the alveoli, and that is going to always help keep the lungs inflated no matter whether you're inhaling or exhaling. And then when you exhale, it might go up to minus four. Notice it's still less than atmospheric pressure. So it's not like you could breathe out so much that you collapse your lungs, because you couldn't get this number um, to a positive number. So when you breathe in, the pressure in the alveoli goes down to 759. When you breathe out, it goes up to 761. And then breathing in, breathing out, and then looking here too. The parietal um, and visceral pleura are separated with some fluid, and the pressure in them goes from um, down to 753, up to 756, down to 753, up to 756, so you get this back and forth. And if it weren't for this always negative intrapleural pressure, this um, the lungs would be collapsed. And that's what happens then if there's trauma and the pleura is pierced with, a, let's say, a stick or something that someone falls on, then all of a sudden, instead of being 753, the um, pleural cavity is 760, and the alveoli, they're so fragile, they can't stay open. 